I'm here with Ruben Carazana, who is um, back in town because he's directing for the first time in Miami, question for mark? The first time in Florida, oh working gosh. professionally for the first time in Florida. Uh, King James. And um, so we didn't know each other mm -hmm. before two weeks ago, before yeah. we started corresponding. You started writing to me mm -hmm. in my memory like two years ago, yeah, sending like me that. plays mm -hmm. that you thought would be appropriate for Gable Stage because yeah. you grew up coming to Gable Stage? Yeah, I mean, I didn't really go to the theater um, growing up, um, except for when I went on field trips um, here at Gable Stage. Um, and then when I graduated from high school, the summer between high school and when I went away for college, it was gonna be the first time in years that I wasn't gonna be doing something theater related. I didn't have, you know, one act competitions to rehearse for, monologues to look for, for competitions or for auditions. And so I wanted to do something that summer. It just felt like such a waste of my time for those three months before I went to college. I reached out to Joe Adler, right, who was the artist director here at Gable Stage at the time, and I asked if I could come in and sweep the floor. And he was like, stop by on Tuesday or Monday or whatever it was, and I came in. He introduced me to the stage manager and said, put him to work, use him. And then for the next five years while I was in college, whenever I would come back for like winter and summer break, I would work here, build the sets, hang in focus lights, house manage, assistant stage manage. And this became like a, like the first professional theatrical place I ever kind of like worked at and felt like a little bit of a home to me. I was surprised when I reached out because you didn't know me and there was no, no reason for you to respond and certainly no reason for you to take me up on like having a Zoom meeting to talk about, you know, this play. So I was, yeah, I was very, you know, people do respond. Like artist directors yeah. typically do respond. At various points in my life, I've reached out to, you know, whoever, whoever I've admired or just places that I've been like, ah, I wonder how they do that. Mm -hmm. um, and constantly put myself in situations where I could be a part of it, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's like a big part of my life. So really where I kind of like, my appreciation for all aspects of what it takes to make theater happen, what really came from like high school, when I was in high school, my high school drama teacher, Miss Sieg, Marielle Besieg, who's coming to see the show. She's very excited to see it. But is she still the drama teacher there? She is still Aww, the drama teacher. Ah, that's fabulous. I visit her every time I'm in town. Wow. I love her. Um, but she, you know, I was mainly an actor. That's all I was interested in doing. And she would require us, if we were gonna go to like one of these like regional competitions yeah. for acting, we also had to compete in a technical category, whether it was directing or playwriting or costume design or whatever. So that was obviously very helpful. And then once I went to SMU, where I went to college, um, you know, we're required to take scenery and stage management. And whereas I think for many people that might feel like an imposition on their education, it's like this thing, this requirement you have to get out of the way. Really? I was just like a sponge. Like I just wanted to soak up all of this knowledge. It was, I don't know, once you learn how to use QLab, Mm -hmm. Like just the, world is the possibilities are endless. Yeah. It's so exciting. Well, I mean, I mean, first of all, theater is a group effort, right. so that's number one. Number two, there's, you know, no, it's a circus. It's yeah. putting up the tent, and everybody has to know how to put up the tent. And certainly, if you're an artistic director, if you're anything, right, in any position in the world for any kind of job of any kind. The more you know, the more you can ask, mm -hmm. and the more ambitious you are, I guess. Like, you uh, you know, the more you ask, the more you learn, and the more you ask, the more you learn. And certainly if you're in charge of something, you have to know enough about everything so that you know at least, at the very least, the right questions to ask. Right. But I think most importantly, it's a very difficult, from the beginning of time, it's a been a very difficult industry extremely yeah. different difficult and if you can make your own work you'll always work yeah 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 that's a big thing once I graduated from college that was like a big thing for me is I've never with the exception of like two or three little pockets of time throughout my career like I've never really been one to put my career my future in the hands of others do you know, like I audition for stuff, I apply to things, I reach out to people, I pitch projects, but I'm never entirely dependent on those things going through because I always have things that I know I can make happen, plays of mine, 
plays written by friends of mine that I know I can help to produce or direct or, yeah, exactly. you know. Um, and yeah, that's been very, very fruitful to continue to like freelance, which is w what I've been doing and what I hope to be able to continue to do. Yeah. 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 Also, it's like such a fragile sector, mm -hmm. you know, this uh, regional theater sector. Uh, we're all like working on it together, mm -hmm. you know, so the yeah. more we can understand what uh, the designers in our industry need, mm -hmm. the more we can um, make sure that everyone succeeds and that the the the, uh, the 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 playing field and the future for everyone is um, equitable and um, fundable. I mean, the more everybody, everybody, and like my mission in life is to tell everybody how it works. Yeah how the funding works. My degrees are in <laughs> acting, you know, like, but like somebody has to raise the money. Yeah. So, um, and I find that so few people, so few really know why it's nonprofit in the first place. Um, what the difference is between nonprofit and commercial and like how difficult it is to make it all work. And the audience too, the, the patrons also, the, the funders also like really have We've done a really good job of like keeping everything, I think, like in the dark. Mm -hmm. You know, don't look back here. Like, don't look behind the, the curtain. You know, um, we want everything to be magic. Yeah. So why directing? <clears throat> why directing? Well, um, when I went to college, it was for acting. That's all, all I was interested in doing. But at the end of my sophomore year, I decided to switch to directing, not because I wanted to be a director, because I didn't. And I made that very clear to the faculty and my directing teacher, but because I thought that I would become a better actor by taking two junior and senior year of directing classes, specifically with my directing teacher, Stan Boyevudsky, who was great and is a mentor of mine. And, um, and so that's the reason why I started taking directing classes and I really hated directing when I first started Why? doing it. It was very difficult. It was so stressful and <laughs> and I've been thinking about this a lot recently because I still feel like I'm pretty early in my directing journey even though I've been, you know, directed, you know, for quite a few years now. But originally whenever I would direct, I would only ever want to direct plays that I could see and feel and hear so clearly in my mind, body and soul. And that was like three plays, you know? I would read it and I was like, oh my God, I see this so clearly, I have to be the one to direct this, right? And so it was a, a compulsion, like a real need to direct. Mm -hmm. And then you'd go through the whole process of rehearsal and making this thing happen and then the final product would go up, it's opening night and I'd sit there and I was like, that's not what I saw in my head. Like this is, and so it, it always felt frustrating and unsatisfying because it felt like I put so much work into it and the end result was not the thing that I originally saw. And so it was really, really, um, yeah, frustrating. As I've done it more, I think two things have happened. One is I think I've gotten better at trying to communicate that thing that I see in my head. Um, you know, there were many many uh, instances where I'd uh, encounter something in rehearsal, a challenge, a question, and be like, how do I address this? And I'd open up my toolbox and I'm like, there's nothing here. I've never encountered this before. I don't know how to do this. Oh my God, right? It's so stressful. The more you do it, the more your toolbox has things. Like, I've encountered this before. I have a couple of ways that I can address this, right? So that's one thing. And then the other thing is I've started to kind of like, like decenter what I call like decentering the role of the director. Like, who cares what thing I saw in my head when I first read the, the script? My job is not to like perfectly capture that thing and put it on the stage, because if that were the case, then we don't need designers. We don't need actors, right? We don't need four weeks of rehearsal. Just going to tech and make the play happen ask the actors to memorize their lines and then we just put it up. What's useful and what's interesting about theater is that I don't need to have it all. Like that's why we have these great people that we bring on and I genuinely want their thoughts and their opinions and their ideas and their vision. And then my job is trying to get all of those things and identify exactly what it is that they're saying and help to specify it and bring it together. And that has made it a much more rewarding yeah. experience. It's yeah. a team sport. Yeah. Yeah. So I try to be, you know, I try to ask a lot of questions during rehearsal. I try to let, you know, the actors and the designers kind of like lead a lot of where the thing is going to go. And my job is to help to um, 
yeah, to point out like, oh, I see this impulse, right? Like capture those impulses, um, uh, 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 speak them out loud, and then try to investigate those and try to see where those are coming from and mm -hmm. how we can like specify it. Yeah, I think too, like, you know, when you're an actor, you're, this is very basic stuff, mm -hmm. but you're playing a, a role, right. you're playing a role in a story. Yeah. The role of the director is to see the great arc of mm -hmm. the story, the beginning, the middle, the end, the climax, the denouement, and to organize the action with the people playing the roles based on what the playwright gives you in the script and make sure that it's not a different story. Sure. And so I guess the first job is interpreting what the story of the play yeah. is, because that's always up for interpretation just within itself. But then making sure that everybody on the ship is paddling to the same destination right. at the same time and that every element of the storytelling, every little bit of the action is in alignment with the spine of the story that's being told. Mm -hmm. I think like one of the reasons that I was like, oh, I think he might be, well, first of all, write for this piece was, was because I knew that I was looking for someone who understood the rhythm of Miami. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the questions I asked was, were you ever here during one of these championships? Okay. Yeah. And like what that experience was like. Yeah. Do you want to tell that story? Maybe you're... Oh yeah, I, well, well I, think, I think there's like two stories that I can share about that. So like one is, you know, I'm not a huge basketball fan today, but there was one year in my life where I watched every single Heat game. And that just so happened to be the year that we won the 2006 NBA championship. You know, I think I was like a freshman or sophomore in high school. And this was before I got heavily into theater in high school. So I had lots of free time. <laughs> and so I watched every Heat game. And that was the year that we had Dwayne Wade and, and, and Shaq. And, um, and we won that year. And I remember, yeah, like you follow this team and you watch every game and you feel like you know these players so well because you spend so much time with them um and so that was you know being a part of like the fandom in a very small way um at that one point in time was was great and then for it to be like for us to win and i think i think that was like the heat's first yeah, ever win in franchise it. history which is so like what a year for me to be a fan maybe i should be a fan more often <laughs> you know um so there was that that personal story of knowing what that feels like and then the other thing is like i remember I don't remember what year this was. I think it was it was after I graduated from college. So I don't know when the Heat won again, 2014, somewhere around there, I'm not sure. Um, but I remember being downtown with with friends or outside the, the stadium and we weren't there because of the game. We were just hanging out. And it was against Oklahoma City. So whenever, whatever that year that was that we beat them and we won and the stadium erupted and the streets just flooded with people and there were cops and there were people screaming and cheering and cussing and people painted in like the OKC colors and people painted in heat colors. And the, yeah. it was just like, you know, being caught in that. There are memories that me and my friends have very vivid memories of that, that evening that have become like inside jokes that we still kind of like tell to this day. Um, and so, yeah, so th those are like kind of like firsthand experiences that I've had with some of the things that I think the two characters in this play deeply um, desire. Yeah. Like as, as Cavs fans totally. who have never experienced that, that's yeah. like the thing that they're after since right. the beginning of the play. I mean, I think that's like, it's, it's, it's why I chose the play too, mm -hmm. not just because Miami <clears throat> plays a role in it, in the play, um, as the uh, antagonist, yeah. um, but uh, also because, you know, I always ask when uh, choosing a season, why here, why now? Mm -hmm. Like, why do this here? Why do this now? And the idea of in such a time of increasing, it seems, especially in an election year, division, mm -hmm. that feeling of coming together and achieving something, even though everybody who was out there yelling and screaming, they weren't on the court, right? right? But the idea of a whole city, whether it be Miami or Cleveland in this case, especially a city whose identity has shifted greatly over the 20th century, like coming together no matter the creed, shape, sex, you know, demographic of uh, of a crowd, of a community, it's it's the city that takes on one voice, mm -hmm. and that feels so amazing to be a part of. Yeah. 
and I guess the optimism and the hope of that is ultimately why I wanted to do this play yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I think you know one of the ways that this play goes at getting to that is like we have two characters who come from different walks of yeah. life and and exactly. they don't immediately get along with each other and the the one way that they do the, the the moments in that first scene at least when they both like get engaged is when they start talking about basketball yeah you know um because even though they've never met each other they don't know each other they probably maybe i don't know would have been friends if they were in high school if they knew each other as as as, as kids um they have these shared experiences and they know the players, they know the players' names, they know that they have this shared history um, that makes it so easily for the two of them to kind of like. But that's what's so classic right. about like men's relationships mm -hmm. in like a sports bar kind of yeah. arena, like you don't have to know anybody. And certainly isn't just men, but like it's a part of this play anyway that these men who are opposite in nearly every way, mm -hmm uh come together and emotionally connect through this shared vocabulary that they have the shared love yeah yeah i mean there's so many i i don't know that i've necessarily had this experience very often because i don't like sports is not a huge part of my life but i know that there are people that go to a bar to yeah. watch a game or go to an actual game in person yeah. and they bond with the person yeah. sitting next to them because you yeah. cheer yes. at the same time. Yes. Oh my God, I can't, did you yes. see that? Yes. Yes. And yes. suddenly, and you might never speak to that person again. Yes. You don't become best yes. friends for life like the characters yes. in this play. But there's this, it's like what theater is, yes. right? It's like you yes. go to the theater and you experience, like I saw a movie recently in um, Megalopolis and, and there was like this shared experience among the people in the audience. Yeah. Where like this ridiculous thing happened on stage and this is an event. Me, yeah, and the me and the guy sitting there, like we started laughing and we were the only ones laughing. And for the next like three or four minutes, sure. we didn't speak to each other. You were but, the, but it was like we were trying to hold in the laughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he would start giggling and then I would start giggling, right? Yeah. And so there's just this This bond. This bond that happens with right. people who you don't know. Which and, feels so good. Yeah. 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 And for many of us it's just like it's just a moment. It's totally. just this bond and then it disappears. Totally. You know? Um Which is what another one of our plays this season is about from a very female perspective, mm -hmm. summer 1976 mm -hmm. is like very much about that. Of like, it asks like, why do you meet someone yeah. over one small chapter of your life? Like, why? Like, what is that? What is that kind of? Uh, um, I don't know. Uh, larger circumstance that is making that happen. Like, why does that happen? Yeah. And what does that change in you? The amount of people that think that the role of the director is to like change the thing or tell the story. What story do you want to tell? It's uh, like oh, oh. we would be we would be fine. Then the the <laughs> changing the words, yeah, yeah like, like changing the word, sure. like making it your own, or sure. um, even you if you're not, your own in a different way. Sure, right, right, right. Um, but that so often, like, what's your what's your like vision for the thing, or what, you know, how are you going to tell this story? As if the role of the director is like put like your big stamp on the thing to say this is sure. this is my version of the story and for some you know directors that that might be the way that that they approach but for me I'm much more interested in really trying to see like what is the what are the explicit truths of this thing and how can I help to kind of like elevate that and support that right you know? I mean I don't know I always ask like what is the story we're telling sure right and just how one interprets that story is very unique to each each person and sometimes when people use the word vision with me I'm like ah oh, like I don't see it I don't see it I don't see. but I can feel it or I can yeah. hear it mm -hmm. you know and then that turns into then a conversation and more than a conversation a collaboration with the designers um, to realize that but sometimes it's the other way around sometimes it's like no i i see it in a in a, in a void and i don't know because it's about magic so right. things have to appear you know but yeah. that's not necessarily how somebody else would does see telling the exact same story but i don't know it happens all the time i find that um what i think the story is is not what someone else thinks mm. the story is yeah. You know, and how to get there is, you know, often very, very, very different. Also, like, theater, just like every storytelling form is unique unto it, 
Peter speaks very often, if not all the time, through the language of metaphor. Mm. And so embracing that and serving that to an audience through the act of telling the story live on stage is a very potent formula for how to turn on people's imagination within themselves, you know? Yeah. I find that one of the things that I've kind of, one of the ways that I've recently come to talk about how I think about my role as an artist is that, you know, so like, I remember when I went to college, there was like a museum on campus and I did not grow up going to museums. I didn't really have a lot of experience with going to museums. And I remember going to this museum and I was a freshman and we were asked to just like walk around. It was like me and my freshman acting class and I was walking around and I was just looking at the paintings and, and, and you don't know what the rules are about. How do you navigate a museum and what do you do? You just look at the paintings. Like that's what I was, it was just this one. Okay. And then eventually one caught my eye and I was standing in front of it for a while. and. <clears throat> one of my classmates kind of like walked by and I got the sense from the way she was talking about the work that she saw it that she had more experience with like art and talking about art and the history of art and different movements and she was with another one of our classmates one of her friends and they looked at this painting that I was looking at they started she started like describing oh oh this is clearly a metaphor for this and um it's a depiction of, of Dante's Inferno whatever like just going off and describing what she saw and there's like a little placard next to the painting where the museum curator wrote down stuff their yeah. interpretation or the backstory yeah. on the painting and so she looks at the painting and she describes all this stuff and then she looked at the placard read it for a second she's like yep i was right and then she walked ah. away and i remember standing there and I, I didn't notice the placard i was like there's an answer like what what do you mean and i looked at the placard and read it and i looked at the painting i was like i guess yeah but i like what i was feeling yeah, better yeah, yeah, yeah. and so one of the things that i realized with my work is like i don't like giving the audience placards do you totally. know, like I yes. like, I, I, when I read a script and it moves me, all I had is the text on the page. Mm -hmm. And so I would feel it'd be a disservice for me to rob the audience of having their own personal experience of the thing by trying to, by trying to um, strip the play of metaphor, of ambiguity, right? And making it, making it mean and stand for only one thing, you know? Um, but it does go back to like what the story is, right? Of and course. what your interpretation of right. that story right. is and how moment to moment to moment to moment that story is built or unravels or Right. I mean because there is no you know, I say my, my job as the director is to find what like the, the explicit truths in the in the script and I was like, there are no explicit no. truths. It's always gonna be through my yes. own lens, through my yes. preconceived notion, through yes. my own lived experience, yes. it's always going to be colored yes. through that. And the clarity right. by which you can um, uh, the clarity by which you can express very clearly what that story is. That, that to me is like something where I'm often in a situation where I'm like, it's, it's, it's beyond like point of view, although point of view is, um, uh, point of view like definitely gets to the point of like, this is the story that we're telling. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily, like, when I'm thinking about, like, myself, I don't necessarily think, oh, this is my point of view, but I am thinking, like, no, this is what the story is. Right. At the very least, like, my interpretation of what the story, this is the story that we're telling. Yep. And this is the way we're doing it. Because to me, whether it's through metaphor and how you feel, or if it's, like, a direct thought, oh, whatever the uh, uh, exclamations are, the moments of epiphany for an audience, which often are in the form of delight, I find, you know, that the the the, the uh, feeling of being delighted often is also an epiphany, you know, mm -hmm. like wonder. And um, I, I often find that in in looking at looking at a lot of plays, I'm often left thinking, what was that about? Mm. <laughs> And why was it so long? Right. <laughs> okay. You know, because if you're like on the journey and there's like plenty of moments of surprise and delight and wonder, then you're like along for the journey. It can be as long as uh, whatever. But if you're constantly like, where are we going? What am I supposed to be invested in? Who Who's my focus? Right. 
what's my focus? Yeah. When I do table work with with when I was doing table work for the actor with the actors for this show, I mean, <clears throat> one of the things I said is like we. I don't care how we get to where we get to, but we all need to know where it is that we're getting. Like every yeah. every step of the way, yes. <clears throat> there are, I think I, I know many people have said this, I know specifically where I read it first was Edward Albee in one of his like essays where he talked about like, there's no, um, there's no such thing as absolute subtext, but there is absolute text. Like our job is to, our responsibility is to the script, is to the text. What happens underneath there in order for us to get there, for each individual actor to get there, that's up to each individual person. Each person needs what they need to get there, but we need to all agree on what is it that we're actually trying to do here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is where I'm like not the most popular yeah. amongst some actors, mm -hmm. very popular amongst others. I don't really care. I'm not paying an actor for them to feel. Right. At all. Yeah. Quite the opposite. I'm paying you so that I feel. Yeah. And it's not always like feel. Like often it's like feel. Mm. But I certainly am not paying anybody for them to go on any kind. I don't really care. Their job, your job, is to go to whatever machinations one has to go to, which often, in my opinion, have a lot less to do with like internal anything and much more to do with external everything, action, um, to make me feel, to make me think, to make me delighted, Yeah. you know? And I think to like, to a lot of people, like that's like a really big way, like, whoa, it's, it's not about me. No, it's not about you. Yeah. Well, oh. because, because it feels good for an actor when you're feeling something. When an actor feels like, as an actor, it feels so good when you're on stage and I'm feeling something. And the, but you forget, it's like, okay, but what about us out here? Like, yeah, we have no access to any of that. that yeah, feeling. I don't know. To me, it's like, well, my honest opinion is that to me, like, that's the mark of an immature actor. Because mm -hmm. to me, um, what feels even better is forward, like, that it's about you, mm -hmm. that it's always about the other, yeah. and that it's about action. What am I doing? What am I doing? What am not, not like, what am I, what am I doing? What am I feeling? But like, in the course of the story, at this moment, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah. And the bigger like context to that is, and why? Well, it's because I'm trying to get him to marry, not I'm trying to, right? I'm getting him to fall in love with me and I'll know that by him proposing at the end of this thing. So in this moment, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. But it's like, to act is to do, it's yeah. all about doing. And to me, like as a performer, like that's like so much more delicious. Yeah than it being like some sort of solo, like it actually makes me like feel nauseous. Yeah, it's, when, it's when acting feels best when it's like, when it feels active. Yes. Like when you're with someone and you're both, yes. the, which is, you know, which is why like this, so much of this play is like, there, there are moments when the two characters are just like butting heads and they're not with each other. But when the play is really flowing is when the two of them are kind of like, you know, they're on the same page and they're talking about this and they're arguing, yeah. they're not agreeing, but yeah. they're like on the same wavelength. Yeah, and that, right. and I think that to me, as you know, yeah. still early days rehearsal, like I see that that's when the actors feel like most, yeah. that's when the, 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 the words are most like readily mm -hmm. available for them. And, and for us in the room who are sitting like me in the stage management team, like that's when we start yeah, like sure. really like leaning in because. I mean, they, right, th those two guys, right? Like what they have in common is that they, we learn that one is so lonely. Yeah. And the other one, is it seems constantly yep. like trying to grasp at things that are not easy coming to him. And he's kind of a, a man on a raft, like trying to like find his way. And so the thing that both of them, it seems to me like want more than anything. And the reason that that feels so good and is so compelling to a, to a, to a viewer, to a story receiver is because what they both want is to connect. Sure with someone, with something, which in this case is basketball, which is what unifies the two of them together too. But, you know, the idea of to connect as an action, um, I think is something that we all gotta have right now, Yeah. you know? Yeah. Thanks for sitting with me and Thanks having like a little deep- Inviting me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's interesting. <laughs>